When you scrape the bottom, there's a magic in that because one, you can only go up, and two, if you've literally been at the bottom, as you go up, you're gonna see every single point along the way that can be seen. Welcome to We Do Hard Things, the show about facing fears, taking big risks, and chasing down dreams. On today's show, how almost dying at 35,000 feet, how being told by his wife that she was going to leave him, and how losing a business that he worked for 12 years to build, how each one of these painful experiences taught one of Britain's most disruptive entrepreneurs the secrets to an extraordinary life. So picture this, it's 2010, and you're boarding a flight heading back home to London, England from Spain. But unlike any other flight, and and trust me, you fly a lot. After all, you were a consultant for McKinsey & Company, you helped build Skype's multi-billion dollar success story, and you're now three years into a brand new startup. But as you board this flight, you feel horrible. That is exactly what happened to today's guest, Eric Partaker. You see, before boarding that flight, Eric felt unwell. The pain was so unbearable that he was actually taken to the emergency room by ambulance and given nitroglycerin to minimize the pain. And he was told, he was told, under no circumstances to get on that plane. But in Eric's own words, that seemed extreme. And he had a business to run, after all. Now, as it would turn out, Getting on that plane would be a decision that would change his life forever. That's what made it so terrifying because it's, you're about as far away from help as you can possibly imagine, right? I mean, I'd have to be an astronaut for it to be further away. And 35,000 feet, that's far enough. Got on the plane, wasn't feeling well. Um, cabin doors closed. And shortly after cabin doors closed, you know, it was it's like... Like it, it was like almost like immediately I was like, hmm, something really doesn't feel right. And plane starts to ascend. And, um, and you're, you're, you're like a young guy, right? Like at the time, yeah. this is, this is, this is what a, a, what, what do you a, mean a at the time? Ago? Like I'm not a young guy anymore. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, no. I mean, this is like a decade ago though. Right. Yeah, so, yeah, so yeah. like you're, no, you're I'm, I'm, an extraordinary, I'm you're extraordinary young guy at that point. Yeah, no, I'm I'm 46 now, so this is yeah. So you're like old. 11. You were you were in your mid 30s. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, right, and you know, not like anything should be happening at that age either, right? So we're we reach cruising altitude, and I have intense pressure, basically just building up in my chest, um, as if something somebody's like sitting on you or putting like a like a safe or like a vault, you know, on your on your chest. I sat there and I like grabbed my forearm, you know, my, 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 my left forearm with my right hand. And then I looked to uh, my colleague next to me, Lewis. I'm like, dude, feel my arm. And he feels my arm and he like looks at me and feels the same thing I feel. Like it was literally, it felt like my arm wasn't even part of my body. Like, like it had been hanging in a meat locker or something. It was ice cold, like, like dead the flight attendant asked if there's a, a doctor on board. Um, luckily for me, there happens to be a doctor on board. Uh, he rushes up to, um, I was seated kind of towards the front of the plane. So he, <clears throat> he rushes up to the front of the plane, takes my vital signs. And um, is, is, sorry, is that, a, is that a really polite way to say you were in business class? <laughs> yeah, no, no, I actually wasn't in business class. <laughs> Yeah, no, I was I was flying the plane. No, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was up towards the front, you know, looking out the window. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, with the the whole like you know steering wheel uh, and uh, takes yeah, he takes my vital signs. And he says we need to land the plane immediately. I think he's having a heart attack. And when you hear that, like that's that you do not want to hear that when you're that high up. So the plane goes into um, its descent. I remember there's a family next to me. Uh, I remember they just like burst out into tears and okay. So, and- so you mentioned that in the book, and I I underlined it because it was just so weird to me. Uh, I looked so so here's a quote from your book. I looked to the left and saw a family of three: a mother, a daughter, and a father burst into tears. I can imagine how that moment. Um, and now I'm 
speaking, you know, I'm not reading, yeah. but I can imagine how that moment is just crystal clear in your mind. Like these moments, these snapshots, these, these crystal clear moments. I underlined it because it just seems like such a weird thing for people to be moved by or worried by that they were start crying, but also that you remembered it and it meant something enough for you to include in the book. That's a really great point, but it's always stuck in my head. Like I remember, I still remember all of their faces and I remember them bursting into tears. And I, I even remembered thinking at the time they're crying because I'm dying, like, or they think I'm about to die. Huh. And, and maybe knowing that their tears were associated with death and that it was my death um, made it, you know, it was almost like you're witnessing you know, the people mourning at your funeral and you haven't died yet. Very much like your nice camera here where everything else is blurred out. They were in high focus, right? And, and, and I just saw them. And, um, and then the first words out of my mouth as we sped off to the local hospital, I looked up into the eyes of the paramedic looking down at me and I said, please don't let me die. I have a five-year-old son. And you know, he said uh, something on the lines of, uh, you know, just, or just rest up. You know, I think we got you just in time. You know, we're going to do our best, that sort of thing. And that was really comforting when he said that, because I think that was like the first moment where I was like, okay, maybe I'm going to be okay. I do remember waking up the next morning in the hospital and being incredibly grateful. Like, you know, it's just weird when you open your eyes and you're like, yes, my eyes are open. You know, I can see something. You know, it's like it all like comes back to you and, and, and you're so grateful that you're just literally opening your eyes, right? And yeah. waking up the next day, yeah. which is a really weird feeling in and of itself. And, um, and then it was immediately replaced with just a lot of um, like stress and guilt and shame because um, I knew why I was there. I mean, I, I had done it you know, to myself. Um, I had worked. Uh, I worked for one of the big consulting firms for, for some years, McKinsey and company. And, you know, that's, that's not like an easy place to work. And so I was putting in lots of hours there, you know, sometimes hundred hours in a week. And then um, I helped build up Skype uh, before we sold it to eBay. And again, you know, rapid blitz scaling tech environment. You know, when you're going for billions, it's not like uh, people are uh, managing work-life balance. Well, you know, it's just work nonstop. And then I, I opened up, um, I was missing Mexican food, having grown up on it in, uh, in Chicago. So then I, then I built <laughs> yeah. what became. <laughs> those, those are the two things that combine, right? Mexican <laughs> food, having grown up in Chicago. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. So then, then, I, then I built a chain of Mexican restaurants and, um, and that was a real grind in the beginning. Um, and part of it, you know, part of it is the choices that I made. You know, McKinsey's a tough work environment. Um, you know, Skype, you know, again, was, was really intense, you know, building, building a chain of restaurants, you know, um, let alone just, just one, right. Is, is not, and it's a, it's a tough industry. I remember in the early days of that, I remember this one particular moment. So we were, we were so worried about getting swindled by everyone. So we would wake up really early three days a week to go to the meat market and uh, like buy all of our you know, meats direct from the wholesalers there rather than getting them you know, delivered to the restaurant. But of course, then you'd have to wake up super early, like wake up at like 3.45 to get there by 4.30. And sometimes we wouldn't close the restaurant in the early days until midnight. And by the time you get home and fall asleep, it's like 12.30. And then you're, you're waking up three hours, you know, 15 minutes later, and you're doing that three days a week. And I remember one morning, my business partner, like I had overslept and he calls and uh, he's like, yeah, Eric, he's like, I'm outside. Where are you? I was just so exhausted. And I was like, dude, I'm like, can't we just like skip it? And he's like, what do you mean? Can't we skip it? He's like, he's like, we, we, we need to pick up the meat. And I was like, yeah, but I don't know, maybe we just don't sell meat today. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's just like suddenly we're just vegetarian for the day. <laughs> oh, I mean, so, I was so, just ready to so break. Speaking, speaking of Chicago, yeah. we drove once. I'm, I'm Canadian. I just live outside of Toronto. We we're driving to British Columbia. Now, British Columbia is in Canada on the other side of the, the continent. But the fastest way to get there is to go through the U.S. Uh, as opposed to going through Canada. So 
my mom, my sister, myself, my two younger brothers who are very little at the time, we start driving and we're driving. It's the middle of the night. And I don't remember any of this, but apparently they wake me up in Chicago at two in the morning and they say, Mark, it's your turn to drive. And I just said, nope. And I laid back down and went to sleep. And then 10 minutes later, they wake me up and say, Mark, it's, it's, it's your turn to drive. And I just, I'm not going to do that. And I went back to sleep. So apparently there's this thing where if you're just tired enough, it you doesn't can, matter what what's going to happen. You can't function. You're not going to do it. <laughs> exactly. And that, yeah, and that's how I felt. Now, Eric admitted to me that a big part of this was the industries he worked in. You know, the consulting world, building a tech company for acquisition, the restaurant business, all notoriously grueling. But more than that, it was also his mentality. You see, Eric shares in his book, The Three Alarms, that as a kid, he always felt mediocre, no matter how much effort he put in. His work ethic, it was hard core. But putting in 110%, it never seemed enough to get him to the level that he wanted to be at. I grew up you know, in a household where it was just like, we were constantly building you know, the homes that we lived in. Um, it was, you know, we were constantly working, you know, my parents would work overtime. And so I just kind of associated success with working really, really hard and working kind of like as much as possible, you know? So with McKinsey, I, I, I went to a state school and, uh, like, uh, you know, uh, so university of Illinois Urbana-Champaign, which is like a good school, but you know, it's not like Princeton or Yale or something. And, um, like if you watch risky business, right. With Tom Cruise, when he totally screws up everything and the interviewer for Princeton is in his, uh, living room. And I think there's like a bunch of drugs and prostitutes everywhere. And, and he's like, uh, the, the, he knows he's not going to be going to Princeton. I think Tom Cruise like puts on a pair of sunglasses and he's like, all right, well, it looks like it's the university of Illinois. So that's where I went to school. <laughs> so, <laughs> that was my school. And, um, uh, but you know, it's a good, it's a good school, but it wasn't, you know, Ivy league. And so McKinsey for me was a way to kind of like level the playing field. I thought if I could get into that company, then it puts me on the same playing field as, you know, all these Ivy leaguers. So that was my motivation for getting in there. I was like kind of ultra competitive and I recognized that I didn't come from the same background as, you know, a lot of, a lot of these other successful people. So I was kind of like trying to strategically play my chips so that yeah but you know i build why? myself but why why i mean missing. ultimately i think um you know it's probably the same story for everyone ultimately you know i wasn't loved enough as a person and you know you, you got a smile on your face for our audio <laughs> listeners like is that it yeah. or are you joking i, I i'm sure it is a heavy component i th- you know it's probably a combination of that like feeling you know like i wasn't like i needed to prove myself although it was never like looking to prove, it was proving myself to myself. Um, I remember, you know, for example, when it came to sports and, you know, athletics, I would try super hard to get on the teams. So I would try super hard to you know, get on the basketball team, get on the football team. And I managed to make the teams, but I never played. And so, you know, I kind of, when I went into university, I, I always, I, I kind of went into university feeling like, I was on the cusp of being amongst the best, but always just outside. And, and so that really, that really ate away at me and that, and, and, and it drove me at the same time. I often say, or feel like if I look back, I feel like I flirt with greatness, but never touch it or achieve it. I feel like I hang out with some of the most remarkable people, but am lucky to be at the table because Frankly, most, more, most people think that I've earned more than I really have. Most people think that I have more than I really have. Most people think because I, I just, I'm very comfortable operating with people at certain levels. It doesn't mean that I have any of those things. And so often I feel like, um, not a fraud. It's not even that. It's not imposter syndrome. It's just like, I, I know what I'm capable of and I'm desperately afraid that I won't achieve it. Now, I know that- That book, terrified me. Too, by the way, I, and what I, you that's, just said. that's where I'm going with this. Yeah. Because you say right openly in your book, even as a child, or or even with this idea of the two percent, and I'd love you to introduce the idea of the two percent. But there's this idea that within each of us, we have the ability to become the most remarkable versions of us as possible. And what if that potential goes unused? What if 
I'm smart enough and self-aware enough of, of myself to be to, to know what is a possible. And yet, because I'm too lazy or because I'm not, I don't know what it is. Whatever it is that keeps me from doing what I need to do to get to where I need to be to hit that level, what if it never happens? Oh, that scares me. It scares me so that, much. That scared the hell out of me. And I, I remember coming across some of uh, Abraham Maslow's stuff. You probably heard of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, which was simply um, his framework whereby, you know, we as people, we seek to fulfill various needs and we have a basic set of needs that we first seek to fulfill before we progress to ever higher need. And so the basic needs in his, you know, you know what's become Maslow's pyramid or hierarchy of needs, the basic needs are, you know, we want to get our food, shelter, safety sorted, all makes sense, right? It's like, I can't even think about if I don't feel safe. I don't have enough food to eat, like forget talking about, you know, career progression or anything. Yeah. That, right. If you don't have sleep, forget picking up a meat order in the middle of the night. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. Bingo. Um, and uh, once those needs are met, then we pursue, you know, higher needs, like a, a sense of love, a sense of belonging. And then he had this thing on the top of the pyramid, the top of the pyramid is self-actualization, which is a mouthful. And all that simply means is um, reaching the state where you become everything that you're capable of becoming. You are operating at your fullest potential. And when I read that, I thought, that's the world's common religion. That's the one thing that unites us all, regardless of geography, geography, ethnicity, no matter where we are. Like, you know, who, if I had a magic button and went around the world and said, press this button, you know, it's become the best, you know, version of yourself. Who wouldn't want to press that? Like everyone would. They press it so hard their finger would break. And so then life became this pursuit of wanting to realize my, my full potential, fueled also by this really scary stat where Abraham in his research estimated that only 2% of people play to their fullest capabilities. Only 2% of people you know, do everything that, you know, that they're able to do, meaning 98% of us Either, you know, ignorance is bliss. So either we don't know. So that's okay, I guess. We don't know that we could have been more. Uh, and that probably affects a lot of people, I would imagine. Probably the majority of that 98%, I bet, don't even realize that there could be something more. But then there is this segment of the 98% who do realize, like, I knew I could be something more. And I wasn't. And I wanted to discover how do I break free from the 98% and join that 2%. And that ended up fueling, I think, a lot of this originally quite ill-placed and, you know, not well kind of prioritized approach to business and life, right? So McKinsey and working my ass off and then Skype and then building the restaurant chain and then almost dying. And then after that, realizing, okay, I have to do this in a more balanced way. And there was three things following that, the plane and the hospital experience. And then a, a little bit of time after it, because it didn't all like click right at me. It's not like, oh, you know, the plane happens. <laughs> you know, it's like, I am enlightened. You know, I'm so far from that even right now. It's like, I'm still trying to figure this all out. But anyways, um, what struck me was three things kind of came together, um, but not, you know, at, at different times. So one, you know, that plane landed because of my health, right? Number two, the first words out of my mouth when I thought I was going to die, wasn't, you know, please don't let me die. I have to clear out my inbox. Right? It was like, please don't let me die. I have a five-year-old son. So relationships are super important to us. When it's all said and done, like when you think it's lights out, that's what you're going to care about most. That's what I experience. You know, if, 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 if you, if somebody gives you five more minutes to live, you got five minutes, how do you want to spend it? You know, whatever, you know, so many people are going to say uh, hugging, you know, you know, my wife or, you know, my husband or spending more time with my kids. You know, that, that's what most, most matters. And then um, obviously, you know, how did I get into that situation was a result of overworking. You know, it's not to say that work isn't important. It, clearly it must be important, but I'm going about it in the wrong way. So, so that whole like, you know, wealth, health, relationships kind of came together to me as these are the three domains that we need to reach our fullest potential in. And that became my kind of peak performance path, which I define as simply you know, getting into that 2%. I think it's important 
that we stop for just a second and spend a little bit of time at this moment in Eric's life. The moment when he realized what really matters most. Now, I will readily admit that I'm kind of obsessed with this topic. And I actually feel like I have to be careful with the number of guests we bring on the podcast who have had near-death experiences. Because at a certain point, you are going to be like, Mark, enough, we get it. And it all becomes trite. But here's why I'm actually obsessed with this topic. Because no matter who I speak with, every single survivor shares with me the same lessons, the same results, and the same truths. And so for those of us who have yet to experience this, and I hope, I hope you've not experienced this yet, but for those of us who have not, we can either choose to accept these lessons as truth, or we can wait to learn them the hard way. Now, getting back to Eric's story, I know when someone has one of these life-changing moments, they can't change all their responsibilities. They can't change all of their thinking. They can't change all of their habits overnight. And so there's this moment where they see the truth, but they're still living their old life. And so I wanted to know, when you learn this thing, how do you untrap yourself from all the things that now clearly do not matter to you now that you know the truth? It didn't all like, it, it didn't create like this massive change that happened, you know, instantly. At first I, I was more, you know, more conscious of my health. So I started to um, watch what I eat and go to the gym more. Um, but I still had way too much alcohol going on. So like I would, when I drank, I, you know, I drank for England. I drank for the country. <laughs> I, <laughs> you know, it wasn't like it's an everyday. it's cultural. So you have all the yeah. reasons and excuses, right? Yeah. Yeah. It wasn't like an everyday thing, but it's like, I, I gave my body a punishment. Right. And so, and that actually kept continuing, which wasn't good thought I was prioritizing and getting things right on the home front and spending more time, um, you know, at home. Um, and then, you know, a couple of years later then my wife was like, uh, yeah, I'm leaving you. And I was like, Oh crap. Yeah. <laughs> this, oh, <laughs> this is like, come on, this is supposed to be getting better, not worse. And, um, and she said that, you know, I was home, but that I wasn't like really, really home. That I wasn't really available that it was still, you know, pretty much just about me. And that hurt. And so that really made me like that, that helped me. I'm so grateful for that. Cause that helped me kind of get through that final bit there where to, you know, to, to genuinely prioritize, you know, spending time, you know, with my family to, you know, make sure that I was you know, thinking about their interests and, and not just mine and, and just being curious with them and, you know, understanding, you know, their likes and, and dislikes and because we think we know but we don't really know and uh, at least i didn't and that took a lot of time too so so it wasn't it wasn't enough to almost die and 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 see oh at the end of the day when when the moment really counts i just want to be here for my son it also takes your wife being able to say i'm out of here as well yeah exactly it's like it, it it required you know being threatened to lose my marriage as well. And so, yeah, I, you know, I really, you know, shaped up then I just, I cut the alcohol out completely. That had a massive impact that, that really helped me, helped me, you know, produce more at work, uh, less anxious. I was less irritable, less anger spells. You know, I used to have a lot of issues with anger, but it was all a process. Now, you know, it, n- none of this, the, the plane was just a catalyst. And, and it just, and there was a series of things I had to, you know, lose a series of things. You know, it doesn't even stop. I'm still losing. Right. So, uh, you know, the restaurant chain that I built, uh, I lost the entire thing to COVID the whole thing. You know, the book, gone. the book opens with you saying that you were able to save it because of a last minute investor, but that didn't happen. Well, yeah. For that investor. <laughs> ah. <laughs> right. Also, interestingly enough, have experienced in each of those three domains, health, wealth, and relationships, either complete or near complete loss. And it's really, you know, it is enlightening. I, I'm not enlightened, but it is enlightening. You know, it, it, it does make you, um, make you make better decisions and better prioritize. And, um, 
And interestingly enough now, so now, you know, we live in Portugal, we moved here three months. Life is actually the best it's ever been, ever. Why? Why? In our, like, in so, so what's, what's the difference? What's, what's, if we're checking off a list, you know, on one side, we have one column on the other side, we have another one. If we could articulate what makes life better after so much loss and struggle, why on the other side is it better? I, I pretty much know what's happening every single week. It's nice and structured. Uh, I mean, you know, these, these, these days I uh, invest in or advise or coach uh, entrepreneurs, basically, uh, founder CEOs. And, and my week is just nice and structured. It's like Mondays and Tuesdays, I do my one-to-one calls. Wednesday mornings, I have you know, new client calls. Wednesday afternoons, I like, you know, coach and mentor leadership teams. Um, Thursdays are typically completely open and Fridays are typically completely open except for maybe a team meeting. And that's my week. And, um, you know, our income level is better than it's, you know, ever been before. Um, Giselle, my wife is happier than she's ever been before. Um, I have two boys actually, one from a previous relationship, the five-year-old reference in the ambulance. Right. And then, um, uh, an eight-year-old as well. Um, both of the boys are, are super happy. Where we live is beautiful. It's sunny, five minutes away from the beach. Do you, do you think you could have fast forwarded through all of that bullshit <laughs> on the <laughs> corporate side and the life and the money and everything to just to arrive where you are now, knowing that Hell less no. is more? No. <laughs> Hell no. I you know, like the Jim Carrey any- quote. Right. The Jim Carrey quote about like, I wish everyone could get rich so that way they could see how hollow it is. It's like, well, I also would like that, but I'd like to get rich too. (laughs) (laughs) Like, like I'll be, I'll be rich before I decide that money isn't that important. Thank you very much. I wouldn't change a thing because it's made me who I am. So as a case in point, you know, when I'm working with these like entrepreneurs, they always say the same thing. They're like, with business coaching, I'm not expecting to also get, you know, health coaching, relationship coaching, like, you know, everything, but I can only do that multidimensionally because of having literally scraped the bottom of the barrel in each domain. And when you scrape the bottom, there's a, there's a magic in that because one, you can only go up. And two, if you've literally been at the bottom, then metaphorically speaking, as you go up, you're going to see every single point along the way that can be seen, right? So I, I, I love that. <laughs> as painful <laughs> as that point of view might be, I love it, you know, secretly. Yeah. yeah. But, you know, that's a very, and this is why I love it so much, it's a very romantic na- notion or point of view of like, when you say hitting the bottom, I mean, hitting the bottom for some people is like bankruptcy and, you know, losing the things that you felt like you've worked for. And, um, embarrassing which I yourself, did. And... which I did with the you know with the restaurant chain. I lost everything, everything. When that happens, the moment, what does that feel like? And then reassure those of us who may face that or may be facing that. How, how do you know that on the other side, there's not just a black hole of nothingness? How is how is losing everything not fatal? Because those who have lost everything rebuild and they go on. And they accomplish things and they seem like great success stories. But how is losing everything not just put you in a, a place of hopelessness as opposed to a place where you're like, oh, look, I can, on the way up, I can pass all these other great milestones. I just don't see it that way. So, how is it not that is because it's absolutely essential, I think, so that you can become you know, something. It's, it just, it's just an incredible grit builder, right? It's an incredible, like if you can get through that, everything else seems easy. So I think one of the reasons why when we hear these stories about people who have um, the wealthy person who came back from you know, a bankruptcy or a total loss, or the person who's suddenly an expert in relationships because they got it so badly in the past, or the person who's had the near-death experience because of poor health and suddenly like they're this health machine, it's because everything for those people becomes a lot easier when you've had it you know, at its toughest. Because if you can survive that, literally everything after that is easier because that's the toughest thing that you could have to go through. You know, there's a, mathematically, it's a point where you, you can't get any closer because otherwise you'd burst into oblivion, you'd be nothing. It's like, that's as close as you can get to nothingness. 
So then anything beyond nothingness is somethingness. But if you've experienced nothingness, the somethingness for some reason seems easier to come by. <laughs> I love that. The somethingness. Okay. Now changing gears a little bit in another part of Eric's book, The Three Alarms, he shares five traps that will keep you and me from achieving that peak performance, the 2% that he mentioned a little bit earlier. Now, here are the traps. Actually, before I read these off to you, I want you just to mentally check off how many of these actually affect you and hold you back. Okay, I'm gonna read them off now, you ready? Trap number one, lack of intentionality. Trap number two, perfectionism. <laughs> Trap number three, too much structure. I'm laughing because I feel like this is a family feud here. Trap number four, does the board say it? <laughs> Procrastination. And trap number five, hyper-focus on a single domain. Okay. Now, which one of those resonates with you? I know for me, like a few of them are like, oh, got me right here. But I want to know from Eric. Eric, now that we know these traps exist, how the heck do we work past them? I mean, I talk about, you know, a couple of my favorites. So one is procrastination. I used to be the world's worst procrastinator. Like I, I, I literally bought a set of books on procrastination. Check. And I, I, I've got that one. I, I cannot help but run in my mind. Why do today what I can do tomorrow? And I, I yeah. even say it like, I don't say it out loud because I, it's very dangerous to say things like that out loud. But I, I literally have those words memorized because in the back of my mind, I honestly always think like, why do today what I could do tomorrow? What a terrible, like, like, what a terrible man mantra, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, <laughs> that's that's what I kind of, you know, live by. I mean, actually, for me, it wasn't so much that I wanted to, to get the stuff done, but I just didn't have the ability to kind of sit down and get it done. So all my success, basically, early in my career, just came at an incredible price. You know, I was work having to work a fourteen-hour day because I should have because I wasn't able to get stuff done in the eight hours, basically. There's a few things uh, with procrastination that um, you know, I think can help people. So one is you have to catch the talk that's going on in your head. Because typically when somebody starts to procrastinate, if they were to verbalize the sentence, when you feel that urge to procrastinate on something, whatever it might be, completing your tax return, for example, you're probably saying something like, oh, I have to, I really have to do my tax return right now. Or I really should be doing my tax return right now. That's, that's this negative language. It's like language of oppression. It's like when you, if you have to do something, it suggests that you're being forced to do something that you don't want to do, right? You know, we never say that, right? We never say, oh, you know, oh, I have to go on a date right now. <laughs> you know, you know, um, oh, I have to spend time with my spouse right now. What a bore, right? I mean, we don't say uh, these things. Hold on. If you say that, that's probably teaching you something about your relationship. <laughs> yeah. Well, what I mean is like, we don't say these things. No, I know. Yet, right? And um, um, and better language, well, two things. One, it's better to acknowledge that, look, you don't need to like doing everything, first of all, right? You absolutely don't need to like doing that. Like I never, going back to a tax return, never in my life have I thought, oh my God, this is amazing. I get to fill out my tax return. I've been looking forward to this all year long. <laughs> you know? It's like, that will never happen. But if you can disconnect the need to like you know, to have to like doing something and instead use the language of choice. So I choose to do it. There's a big difference, right? And that positive self-talk by just focusing on choice, I choose to do my tax return instead of I have to. It just puts you back into control, it makes you feel like you're not being forced to do something, acknowledges that you might not like it, but that you're just choosing to do it anyway. And um, another thing that I do um, is... Uh, I play this game called the quality time block game. So when my day starts, I look at how much free space I have in my day. Let, let, let's say on a given day that I have like three free hours. Free hours meaning I don't have meetings or anything else with somebody, like free for me to use as I wish. And a quality time block for me is 25 minutes of uninterrupted, distraction-free, um, you know, focused time with intention. So I can do multiple things in the 25 minutes, but as long as I intentionally decide before I kind of start the timer, here's what I'm going to work on so that I'm not jumping around like a, you know, a rabbit. And, um, and if I have those three free hours, I'll look at them and I'll go, okay, that's 
six QTBs that I could do. Um, but if I start a QTB, if I get to the 24th minute, and let's say I suddenly pick up my phone because there's a notification or I go into Slack or I answer an email or um, I answer the phone or I just get up and uh, I'm just going to reheat my tea or coffee or something. I've lost the QTB then. So I need to stay completely focused, distraction free for the full 25 minutes in order to get it. And do you have ADHD? Oh, yeah. Well, I, I, I used to like not be able to stay seated for like five straight minutes. Like I constantly be jumping around. But have you been, have you been diagnosed as an adult or a kid? Uh, not with ADHD, with, with Asperger's. So that's interesting. Um, yeah. How does that um, affect you? Um, I, I don't like things to change too much. So like when my, my wife loves changing things in the house, and so she'll change the furniture and that will really stress me out. I can understand I, now why, when you say your schedule, you know what's happening each day and why that's comforting. I can understand why that yeah. would be based on I, this. And, and at the same yeah. time though, how much being an entrepreneur is anything but that. Well, yeah, but it, it, I mean, it's, it's helped me, I think, in that um, it, it allows me to go into like hyper-focus and just get lost into stuff. In a, in a particular area, I can become sometimes to my detriment, like ultra obsessed with it um, yeah. and going very, very deep and like into the detail. Again, sometimes to my detriment because I'm missing a you know, big picture going so deeply into something. Uh, I embrace it. You know, it's, it, it, it makes it challenging sometimes. It, I, I don't like doing small talk with like, you know, big crowds of people. You know, my wife the other day is like, yeah, we got this parents event for the school. Um, you're going to come with me? And, no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to do that because, you know, I can't, I can't sit there and have the conversations about the weather and all that. Like I just. Huh. Do, you, do you see it as a superpower at this point? I do now. But, but, but only after I was able to kind of really like harness, you know, the things that were distracting me and kind of pulling me away from productivity, especially, you know, cause there's this like perfectionism tendency, you know, that I had with it, which was so deep, like next level, like stratosphere level, um, that would lead to procrastinating because things needed to be so exactly right, you know, down to like making a presentation, for example, and noticing that uh, the one margin on the one slide was like just slightly, you know, narrower than the other side and then needing to fix that and, you know, all that sort of stuff. <laughs> so, on a domain. so I can understand, you know, with you sharing, you know, everything that you've worked through in your background, why those traps would be so relevant to you, but they just felt so relevant to me. So it's, it's, either, oh, really? it's either we're cut from the same cloth or uh, these are universal things that hurt a lot of us, I think. The, the too much structure one is interesting too because <clears throat> so, the tip of, so the path that I went on, so you, you realize you're not operating at your full potential. So yes. you're like, okay, I got to get my together and figure out how to operate at my full potential. And, and so the typical way people go is that they go into hyperstructure. Okay, I'm going to do this then and then this, you know, and so what ends up happening is that invariably life happens. You know, John Lennon, life is what happens while we're busy making other plans. And when life happens, life gives two about your structure, doesn't care what you had planned for your day, you know, and so you have, you reach a decision point. Are you going to get upset about your structure being disrupted yep. and therefore be inflexible? Or are you going to kind of go with the flow of life, you know? martial arts be like water. And, um, and there's this concept called a, the river of flexibility, you know, and you got two banks to, as you do with any river. Um, and the one bank is structure and the other one is spontaneity. And if you overflow the structure bank, you end up in the land of rigidity. And if you overflow the spontaneity bank, you end up in the land of chaos. Nobody wants to deal with a chaotic person. Nobody wants to deal with a person who's too rigid. And so really, what it is, is that you have to just get good at staying in the river, not overflowing either bank and just bouncing from structure to spontaneity and kind of staying in between that. I don't know how to, I don't know how to get stuff done in that environment very well. You know, there was a time 
about a year and a half ago. So I, I, I look at my energy levels and I, I kind of track things. And I noticed that context switching from work to weekend mode was just destroying me. You know, I'd hit Friday afternoon. I wouldn't be done everything I wanted to be done. I would be in flow for work. I would just, I would drive home full of anxiety, just thinking of all the, the stuff that I was in the moment of. Yeah. And then I would transition to weekend mode. And then by Sunday night, I was just like, party, friends and family and kids and, you know, yeah. sunsets and swimming and like, like, this is what life is about. And then Monday would be like, what was that thing? I was so important on Friday and, and switching back would just, my Mondays were terrible, like terrible, depressing. I hated them. So I pitched to my wife, like I should do like on a 14 day or maybe like an 18 day cycle, like 12 days of work and then four days off. Right. Like it, it makes sense to me. It's it, it all equals out to the same stuff. Anyway, she hated the, she hated every single aspect of the idea. So you talk about rigidity and stuff. Uh, and and yeah, I mean, there's been so many times where for me to get stuff done, to make like a lot of progress, to really focus, I do super, super well in like ultra rigid environments that are completely inflexible to anything else or anyone else. Mm. But at least I can make stuff happen. Uh, or... Uh, it seems like it's just like chaos. It, it seems to me when you talk about those two flows, like I do very well in either one of them, but one, I get stuff done, but I'm unbearable to be around. And the other one, life is amazing. And yet I don't get anything done. I don't, I don't know personally for myself, if I do very well flowing through this river. <laughs> well, <laughs> I'll give it, maybe it's because I need to make it slightly more practical. So let's say that. <laughs> Less poetic. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, so let's say, let's say that, um, go back to the three hours example, you got three free hours. So if you're super rigid, you're like, I'm going to work full on those three hours and don't disturb me because that's going to piss me off and it's going to disrupt my flow. Okay. So that's hyper rigid, right? Yes. Nobody wants to my kids will that. tell you that if they knocked on the door, or, or even this morning, I said, I, I, I was uh, working through some of your book, some of the end of the book. And it was like, I went into work mode sitting at the kitchen table. And so the kids couldn't talk to me, even though it was before school. They asked me a question and I looked up like, yeah, like, can't you see I'm reading? Like I'm in work mode now. Like I've gone into work mode. Leave me alone. Work mode. <laughs> yeah. Very so, 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 and then if there's a knock on the door and if it's Leo, my, you know, eight year old, Oh, well, I have a decision right there. So, you know, do I stay rigid or am I in that moment going to allow spontaneity? And so what I've learned to do over the time since I was completely rigid is, and it also helps too, because I ask myself, I don't do this anymore. It's just kind of embedded it. But I started to ask myself when, right when that moment would happen, whatever the interruption or the trigger was, I'd ask myself, how would the best version of me respond to this right now? Not me right now, the very best version of me. How would that version respond? And then I always knew what the answer was, right? The very best version of me, like the 95-year-old version of me. Okay. And it's, yes, Leo, come in. Leo comes in. What do you need? Pop, I was just wondering about this. Okay. Yeah, I know that's super important for you, but I'm just doing some work right now. So can we talk about this later? Sure. Okay, Papa. When are you done? hour and a half. Okay. Talk about it then. So I started to do more of that as an example. And that for me is flowing in the river, bouncing from the structure to the spontaneity bank. I love it. We're bumping up against the hour. So let me, let me end by asking you this. Um, having seen what you've seen, having done what you've done, having the successes, having faced the bankruptcies, being on the other side of this now in Portugal and, you know, drinking, well, I guess you're not drinking anymore, but I was going to say drinking the wine and living life and all very med Mediterranean. Uh, for you at the end of the day, what does it all come down to? Do you feel like you did your best or not, you know, in the day? Do you feel like you got to Is that enough to get day? you into the 2% though? Yeah, I think so. Because if you've done your best, at least 80% of the time, then you're good. I actually, I, 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 I you know, I, I, it's kind of, once again, it's kind of just ingrained, but I, I used to, I used to track that. I'd get to the end of the day and I'd say, did I do the best that I could today? And I would put a W in the calendar. Or if I didn't, I'd put an L, not for loss, but for learn. And I would just think I got to either win or learn the day. And my little game was never two L's in a row 
and never more than six in a month, such that 80% of the time I was winning, allowing for 20% of the time to be learning. And, and I thought that helped me kind of just get better perspective and also just adjust my expectations on a daily basis for whatever the context, you know, of my reality was, because sometimes your day doesn't go to plan. And as long as you can get to the end and you say that, hey, I still did my best, then you're still good. I really like connecting with Eric. I don't know if it's his openness to just like chat or the fact that he has like this calm, reassuring way about him. But in speaking with him and in working through his book, The Three Alarms, I'm reminded that we have time, that we can rebuild, and that most important things in life come down to health, wealth, and relationships. Okay, three key takeaways from this conversation. Number one, only 2% of people live up to their potential, meaning that 98% of us never, ever live up to our true potential. Now, that stat shouldn't, should not, should not make you feel hopeless or like you're one of the unlucky 98%. It should drive you to do whatever you have to do, face those hard things, take action, and push yourself to become one of the 2%. Number two, facing near loss, like almost losing your relationships, all of your money, all of your health, and coming back from those near losses will help you make better decisions, prioritize what matters most, and help you prepare for future tough times. So while this seems scary and painful and difficult, and we all work to avoid it at all costs, if it happens to you, it's not the end. And number three, ask yourself, how would the very best version of you respond in any given moment? Not the impatient version or the angry version or the bitter or hurt or ashamed versions of you, but the one that would make you proud to actually be the the person that you want to live up to, the person you want to become. How would they respond? And then go and be that person. Now, if you have something to prove to the doubters, to the haters, to that little voice that screams at you from the back of your mind, if that is you, you've got to face the hard things in your life. It's not easy. It's never easy. But remember, we, we aren't just dreamers. We're doers because we do hard things. You have got to hear how this world record setting Olympic athlete could win silver medals and yet still feel like a failure for not getting gold. But more importantly, what she did to fight back from that crushing defeat. Click on the video right over there for another real inspiring story.